What is, wow, what an honor to be Check. at Heritage Foundation. Wow. Thank you. It's great to be here. We're, uh, wow. we're doing a kind of a press tour here in D.C. And, uh, and in New York City to promote our new upcoming first ever live CD on Cleopatra Records. Cleopatra is the largest independent record label in the world, and they're releasing our new album, Boys Night Out, uh, in, on April 15th. In other words, if anybody has any money left, they can... <laughs> <laughs> I doubt many, many will with the way things are, but uh, we're uh, hoping for a, a big uh, press tour here, and uh, it's working out very well for us so far. And uh, April 15th is the release date, and... Um, and I, I, I just might want to add here that uh, if you're fortunate enough to get a tax refund, uh, you can use some of your tax refund money to buy our new CD. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think there's many of those anymore. <laughs> but anyhow, uh, they're also releasing it. They talk about a, a round trip kind of thing for all of us, because as you know, we've been together 41 years, and the group history goes back before that. But they're also releasing it in vinyl. And I can't tell you how excited people are when we tell them, oh, we're releasing in vinyl. Everybody's going, yay, vinyl. <laughs> so vinyl's a big deal. So um, we rushed in here, and I don't even know for 100% sure that we know what we're doing. <laughs> but it is an honor to be at the Heritage Foundation. Thank you for having us and hosting us and for waiting on us. We appreciate it. And I guess if there's any questions or anything, we would be more than happy and thrilled to answer. And you can direct it to Richard or William Lee or Dwayne or Joe uh, any way you want to. And we'd be glad to chat with you today. Thank you. Yes, sir. It was a total coincidence. In fact, I thought it was rather humorous when we saw that April 15th was our release date. At least it's a memorable date for everybody to remember. But um, yeah, it was total coincidence. <laughs> so, sir. And I think we get to spend a lot of time with a lot of people. You're right. We're kind of a quintessential American music group, and we have been able to play all your big fairs and festivals and beautiful performing arts centers all across the country, about 150 dates a year. So, yeah, we look middle America right in the eye. And uh, I think you find uh, the mixed bag everywhere that you find in America today. Um, you know, some people think the way things are going is cool. I find that most people I talk to, and then maybe it's because I lean so far to the right that I almost fall over that way. Um, I, I think that I find that there's a lot of people that are upset with how things are going. And um, the healthcare thing has been a, you know, like everybody warned about, all those things are starting to transpire. And I see people worrying about those kind of things. And um, we'd like to see our country get in a more positive conservative track again. And I know we would like that. And uh, hope that that can, that can eventually happen, thanks to the work people like you do here at Heritage Foundation. But um, Overall, people, I think, are just concerned about themselves and their families and their jobs and, uh, and what's important to them. And um, therefore, it falls down in such a way that, uh, that I think a lot of America would like to see it happen. I think what we need to do uh, is not worry so much about, oh, my gosh, are we going to get the Hispanic vote? Are we going to get the black vote? Or what are we going to do to secure all that? I think we just need to get more people voting, period. I mean, when you look at it, there's just not enough people that vote in this country. People talk, but they don't vote. And um, I don't know how, what the answer is to that, and that's for the think tank to think about, but <laughs> we need to get more people out to vote, is my opinion. And I think if we got more people out to vote, I think we'd see some positive changes. That's, that's the way I feel about it. Anybody else? <laughs> Did that pretty well. Yes, yes. Ronald Reagan is the reason that I got my father to vote for someone other than a Democrat. 
I might say that in our shows, we do not really ever get into politics because we feel like that a good possibility that close to half of our audience may think another way. But I think it's also been pretty widely publicized that we are close friends with President 41, George H.W. Bush, and we've been to his home many times to stay with he and Barbara. And when we first met George Bush, 41, was when he was vice president and Ronald Reagan invited us to come do the congressional barbecue. Until that time, we had really stayed away from politics. But on that day, we realized something had changed. We were in the midst of doing a sound check on the White House lawn, and here came this long, lanky guy with a plastic bag over his shoulder, literally running down toward the stage. And it was George Bush, and he was vice president at that time, and he told us, I brought some uh, T-shirts for all of you. I have vice president T-shirts for you. Which, and we, I, which we had no idea existed. You know, <laughs> and we had heard that he was a fan of ours, but we didn't really know for sure. A lot of people say that. But the, he, then he announced, I'm a big fan of your, groups and I, uh, your group, and I would like for you to do uh, some songs for me. I've got to go to Africa. I can't be here tonight. So would you do some songs for me? Well, sure, Mr. Vice President. What would you like to hear? He started naming album cuts, not the songs that have been hits on radio. So we knew that not only was he a fan, but he was familiar with our entire catalog. So we did several songs for Mr. Vice President at that time, and we, uh, our friendship has only grown over the years. We saw him uh, a little over a month ago. He and Barbara came to our show in Galveston, Texas. Back a year prior to that, when he was in ICU, we got a call and asked us if we would mind calling him and cheering him up. And we did, and we just happened to do a video in our office of the event, which was basically calling them on the phone. And we decided we'd send that to, to him for his own keeping, if he would like it. He asked us to sing a couple of songs. And when they received the video, they said, you know, there's a radio station down here in Houston area that's announcing that he's died. We need something to counter that. Would you let us play that? The thing went viral. It went around the world. And uh, we told him, sure. And uh, he, the next day he got out of ICU, he gave us credit for that. So. In fact, we went to the, his home in Houston in, in January. Uh, this was a year ago. Right after he'd been so sick, he'd finally went home. And, and I remember us very humbly saying, humbly, we said to Barbara Bush, you know, Barbara, uh, we didn't mean for all that to be big deal press and make it look like we healed the president. And Barbara Bush said, well, you did. <laughs> so, yes, like Dwayne said, and I think it's important to note, on our stage at night, we don't, we don't talk politics. We go out there and sing the songs that people want to hear from the Oak Ridge Boys. But we have been very active over the years, and we have to give a lot of credit to the influence of George and Barbara Bush in our lives. I think they're great Americans, and we've grown to love them so very much over all these years. And, um, and they're great servants. They've done amazing things for our country. It was, it's because of Ronald Reagan and then George Bush and all that got us kind of going. And yes, we campaigned with Senator Dole. We went out there and did it. We campaigned with George. Because Barbara told us to. Yep. <laughs> she did. And we were on the campaign trail uh, with, of course, George Herbert Walker Bush, 41, when he lost to uh, uh, President Clinton in, in, uh, in that election. We were on the campaign trail twice with George W. Bush, and he won both times. And uh, we were out with Mitt Romney last year, giving it our best shot, too. So although we don't talk about politics on stage, we have lent ourselves to what we believe in on many occasions. And, um, and we haven't seen any real backlash from that at all. In fact, We, if we also went out with John McCain, I might add. We did. Yeah. We went out with John McCain. Yes. 
Oh, Senator, look who all? has oh. Look at us come to our presence. Uh, I can only stay a minute. I have to go sing a song in the White House in a minute. Uh, <laughs> gentlemen, Senator Dumas. Uh, sing it well, sir. Good to see you, Senator Dumas. Honored to have you here. Now, I know you probably never wear a tie, but we do have heritage ties, and I brought, and you, I guess you could give Thank them you. to friends. And, I wear a tie. At a funeral, maybe. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you well, I don't know what you could do a scarf with it, whatever. You do. Thank you. But we, we we are very honored that you take the time to come by, and that any anyone in the music business and show business who's willing to to stand up for traditional ideas, conservative ideas, it, it's a huge boost boost to what we do. So. You honor us thank for being you, here. Thank you for the work thank you're you doing. Your, yes. uh, thank you. We're going to keep you. doing it right here, but keep, keep the conversation going. Thank uh, you. Great to see you. Thanks, thanks a lot. It's wow. Got, got like a little whale on it there. <laughs> a little, little pink whale. I wasn't, ex wasn't expecting that. I always thought it was an elephant. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Oh, Golden, you want to answer that? Where's music headed, and do you have any favorite young singers? Give us your take on the music industry today. Oh, Lord. <laughs> There's a lot of great young talent in uh, country music, for sure. Uh, you know, we live in Nashville, but uh, we've been fortunate to meet a lot of these young people as they've uh, come into the business, and... Uh, a lot of them are making great contributions to country music. They're certainly taking the bar to a higher level, uh, selling more records than anyone has sold uh, in a long time. And if you kind of look back at country and look at where rock and roll was and how it kind of evolved, and then hip hop came along and uh, kind of changed rock and roll and it seemed to be uh, not much of an outlet for young uh, music that uh, was playing music with an edge and but I think country kind of opened its arms and uh, embraced a lot of young talent that was coming along and gave it a platform to uh, expand their talent and to uh, to expose their talent and Certainly, at some of the great uh, times that I feel like that country music is e enjoying tremendous success today because of the impact of a lot of young talent that's come into the business through the past few years. And, uh, you know, it, as Joe mentioned earlier uh, in the day here at, with the Voice of America, that uh, people like Garth Brooks came along and opened the door for people like uh, Shania Twain, then it was Taylor Swift, and then we have other young talent that's come in now. Uh, you got the band Perry, and uh, but uh, there's a lot of great, great talent in country music, and uh, it's it's exciting for us as people that spent most of our years performing and touring in country music to see the excitement that's happening in today's country music world and uh, and then to realize our place in the years past of being trailblazers ourselves in country music when we were con considered to be contemporary singers and musicians uh, back in the early in the late 70s and uh, early 80s and uh, so yeah, music is in a good place. I feel like, and it's uh, it's also good to see country being wide open for young talent, songwriters, musicians, and performers. And uh, so I feel like that uh, country has a, a bright future if they continue to introduce all the young acts that are coming up in country music now. Well, there's a whole lot of people that helped us in country music. Uh, Johnny Cash, he, uh, he gave us work when we were about to starve to death because first, we were a gospel group. 
and we made that move from gospel to country. And there were a couple of years in the middle there where we were no longer accepted by gospel because we were trying to go country, and that's a no-no. However, Johnny Cash embraced us, and he gave us dates, paid us a lot more than we were worth, helped us sur to survive. Then our manager, Jim Halsey, who managed practically everybody in the business at that time, but he saw something in the Oak Ridge Boys that he wanted to manage. And he told us, he, you guys are three minutes away from becoming a household name. And what we need to do is get you off of this one particular label, which doesn't know what to do with you, and get you on another label who does, and get you a great producer, and get you a hit song, and you will become a household name. And to make that transition from gospel to country was not an easy thing. There are very few acts that have ever done it. And we found a song ironically called Y'all Come Back Saloon. And people knew we wanted to have a country hit just by the title of that song. <laughs> and it hit. And we followed with one right after another. And there was a period of time from 77 till, oh, I don't know, over a decade that we could do no wrong. Everything that we recorded went to the top. And we had hits all the way into the 90s. In fact, we've had chart records in five decades now in country music. From a musical influence standpoint, you have to look at some of the great Southern style gospel quartets. All of us guys, when we were young guys, were very much moved by the quartet singing in the deep south of the southern style groups like the Blackwood Brothers and the Statesmen and, and uh, the Oak Ridge Boys of that day. Because uh, the Oak Ridge Boys, a lot of people may not know this, got our, got began in, in, in the 40s. Uh, there was a group called the Georgia Clodhoppers, believe it or not, in Knoxville, Tennessee, that was a bluegrass gospel band. And when they were doing the Manhattan Project in Oak Ridge, the secret installation where they worked on the atomic bomb that would end the war in the Pacific, as you historians know, the only group that was allowed in to perform for those who were sequestered there, military personnel, their wives, families, scientists of all kinds, um, were the clodhoppers. And thankfully to God, they became known as the Oak Ridge Quartet. And they used to go over there and sing. In fact, a couple years ago, they showed us the spot at the secret installation where the Oak Ridge Quartet would sing on Saturday nights. And they named a, a street after us there in Oak Ridge. So there's an Oak Ridge Boys Way now right outside of the secret installation there where, where they did the atomic bomb. It's an amazing history when you think about it. And after the war was over, that group moved to Nashville, started the Friday night singing convention at the Grand Ole Opry. And during the 50s, after changing some personnel to younger guys, changed the name from the Oak Ridge Quartet to the Oak Ridge Boys. So all of us were fans of the Oak Ridge Boys before we ever joined the group. William Lee Golden joined the Oaks in 1965. Dwayne Allen in 1966. Richard Sturban in 1972. Myself, I joined in 1973. I'm the new guy. <laughs> He's our baby. Yeah. <laughs> I am the youngest. <laughs> but, uh, you know, so it's an amazing story in history. And uh, to go back to square one with you, sir, I think that uh, Southern-style gospel music had a lot of influence on us, even influenced by the Oak Ridge Boys, which is kind of unique in, in and of itself. I'd have to say myself personally that Elvis influenced me. Uh, and for a reason very similar to what Joe has just described, Elvis always had a, a quartet singing behind him, always had a bass singer. Joe has fascinated me personally. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so Elvis was definitely, you know, uh, an influence on me. For about two years prior to joining the Oak Ridge Boys, I sang in a group called J.D. Sumner in the Stamps Quartet. For about a year and a half of that time, I had the privilege to sing with the king. So I actually sang with the king of rock and roll for about a year and a half of my life. And fortunately, fortunately I was smart enough to make a very wise decision. I decided to leave the king of rock and roll 
joined the Oak Ridge Boys because I also was a fan of the Oak Ridge Boys. And I obviously made a very good decision in my life there and went on to bigger and better things with the Oak Ridge Boys. And as a plug, Richard wrote a book called From Elvis to Elvira. <laughs> <laughs> Look it up. It's cool. Yes? Um, <clears throat> so you guys have been together something like 40 years now. Yeah. How have you managed to stay friends for that long period of time? <laughs> We've had our ups and downs, and it's kind of like a marriage. Uh, if you want to stay together, you've got to learn to say, I'm sorry, I was wrong. And you've got to learn to get bigger than the problems that weight you down. It's pretty simple. You can either, uh, you can either get your finger and stick it in someone's stomach like that and just bug them. Or you can get bigger than that. And we all know all of our little hang-ups. And as we've matured as men, they're so unimportant. Just like a husband and a wife, the things that tear marriages apart are when you let little things build up and you don't work them out and they just keep building and up, building up until all of a sudden everything is wrong. Well, wait a minute. It's not everything that's wrong. It's just this little one thing. Let's work that out. This little one thing. But then you can look at it as a whole and say all of those little things are really unimportant in the big picture. And the big picture is there's only four Oak Ridge boys in the whole world. We sing. We call it playing music. It's not working music. It's playing music. We get to play for a living. So we must learn to understand how truly blessed we are by God, our creator, that gave us our talent. And he also gave us the ability to learn how to grow up and become bigger men than the little problems that weighed us down. Sometimes you just got to know, I like to say we're mighty oaks, but we like to be willows from time to time. You got to learn to <laughs> bend and weave. And Dwayne brings up a marriage. I know like in my house, we have a lot of cats. So it's important for a man to know his place. If there's five cats, you're in sixth. If a new cat comes into the house, you drop to seventh. <laughs> as long as you're aware of that and can make it work for you, then there's no problems in the house. I'm number eight. <laughs> <laughs> That's so silly. Uh, yes. I see. I think the lowest note I've ever recorded was, was it an F, an F sharp maybe? It's uh, an F. E yeah. flat. E flat, okay. Uh, low, low C. Yeah. Uh, on the first step to heaven. <laughs> yeah. But then, uh, normally at night, I, I kind of, my bread and butter on stage is usually right around a B flat. You know, I live there most of the night. Uh, sometimes an A flat. On a good night, I can do a G, but okay. You know, so but, but that but low C to B flat. That's kind of like my where I live most of the night. That's my bread and butter. Yeah. Oh my gosh! <laughs> yeah, sometimes us. Us. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we all went through that. We lived uh, through that. Uh, you know, we've all been through that period of times in our life, and I'm sure you have too. And you're just not on stage. So <laughs> when, when, you're, when you get on stage, it's broadcast to the world, and, it, and it's multiplied and magnified, and it seems a lot worse than it is. But Blake and Miranda are really not getting a divorce. And they laugh about it quite a bit. That, and, you know, we were talking about it in Voice of America. Everybody was talking about, you know, the Justin Bieber thing, throwing eggs and all the trouble he's in, and, and talked about that kind of thing this morning. I said, you know, when you look at all the big names in country music that are out there right now, and they're all one-name people, Keith. You know, I mean, it's just uh, it's amazing 
you don't really see any of these kids right now on the tabloid pages. The most they've been able to come up with is Blake and Miranda are divorced, and then they're not. So that, that's, that's about it. So I, I think a lot of people, people kind of, I think they're keeping it cleaner in this day and age than they ever did back in those 70s and all. You know, a lot of people, I think, were more crazier in the 70s, including me. I'm happy to announce that we are, as of two years ago, members of the Grand Ole Opry. So, so the answer to your question is yes, we performed at both of them. And the Mother Church of Country Music, which is basically the Ryman, the old Ryman Auditorium, there's nothing that gives me a thrill anymore in the music industry than to go there. In fact, my wife is a backup singer. She sings on all the Grand Ole Opry shows. She's been on the Opry for almost 40 years. And I like to go down to the Opry when it's in the Ryman and get me a seat behind the sound man, either on stage or out in the audience or in the first row of the balcony and look down at the stage and watch it all develop. And I sit there for the whole thing. I never miss one song. I still love the music industry. And you know, there's a, a certain charm to the new place too. I mean, it is the Grand Ole Opry. I mean, whenever you're playing the Opry, it's an honor and it feels good. And uh, there's an excitement level there because it's a bigger crowd and a bigger stage and uh, the sound and everything's probably a little better there. But like Dwayne said, there's something about that old, that old rhyming down there that it's just magic. There's just so much history, you know. That, that has transpired there from all of our peers from many years past. So it's a blessing. And on, on the stage of the uh, new Opry House, which has been completely redone here just within the last few years, and we had those devastating floods came through Nashville and uh, completely flooded out the, uh, the Opera House. So they had to redo it. But on the center of the stage, there's a circle from the old uh, uh, Ryman Auditorium. And... Every time we play that building, we all have to touch that touch that that floor because there's something very very special about it. You see, there's four of us, you know, and a lot when we go out to sing and they introduce the Oak Ridge Boys, it's boom, 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 and we're singing and singing, and the circle's kind of over there. And I know that I always got to make sure somewhere doing a song that I. <sighs> <laughs> got to get in the circle, man. Got to feel the circle. That is not going to be on C-SPAN, is it? <laughs> Anybody? <laughs> okay. oh, Anybody God. else? Yes, ma'am. Well, maybe I just lost my razor. Well, let me tell you something. We were at an event last June in Nashville, and all the Duck Dynasty guys were all there. And they made William Lee a honorary member of the Robertson family. <laughs> but long before there was the Duck Dynasty, William has had that beard. In fact, one of the things that gets to me sometimes, and we're walking through an airport or something, and some guy goes, ZZ Top, man. <laughs> He looks like ZZ Top to me, man. And you know, ZZ Top made the beards famous, that's true. But they got ugly beards next to that beard. That's, that's, that is the beard in all of music right there. You're looking at the beard. Everybody knows him. I walk behind him sometimes just to watch him. Okay. Well, uh, go ahead. Yes. We call Ron Chancey the Filth Oak. And he was that producer that our Jim Halsey manager told us we had to have. And when Ron Chancey came to see us to see if he would produce us, his biggest fear before he met us 
was that he would lose his Miller beer commercials because we were coming from gospel music. And he was the number one commercial, beer commercial producer, as, as well as many other things like the Like a Rock that Bob Seger did. That's a Ron Chancey production. And that was his biggest fear. But when he went back to Nashville and started seeking songs from the music community, this one song, the Y'all Come Back Saloon, was the first song to come on, come on the table. And once he heard that song, he knew it was a hit. I think the demo could have been a hit. It was that good. But when he realized after playing it for us that we would record that song about a saloon, then he forgot about the rest of his fears. And we had a long relationship with Ron, which still holds true today. There is still talk that we might go back into the studio with him again. All of the gold and platinum and double platinum records that hang on our wall has his name as the producer. And he's still one of our dearest friends. He's retired now. But about three years ago, we did a project for Cracker Barrel. And they asked us to record Elvira again. So we thought, well, if we're going to re-record Elvira, we've already got all the musicians hired and we've got the studio reserved and we might as well get Ron Chancey to come back and produce it because he produced the original. And he came back and we asked him to go find us a couple of new songs to go with it. And he went out and into the music community and just became Ron Chancey again and brought in two more great songs. And we re -re we've done things over a period of time with Ron not like during the time when everything we were doing was going straight to the top of the charts. We're not in that we're not in that period of time in our career now. But we're all about making good music and cutting great songs because great songs are the great songs are the secret to the longevity, the depth and the breadth of one's career. If you cut great songs, then the songs will be good to you for years to come. So when we cut albums with Ron Chancey and you get past the singles that you hear on radio, you can go to cut 11 and 12. They could have been a hit too. We cut great songs when we record, and he's the main reason for that in our country music career. I might add that Ron Chancey was also always brutally honest with us. You know, if we were singing something not right, he wasn't afraid to say, now, boys, you know, you're kind of kind of gospeling out on me right here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we always listened to him. In fact, we had a song one time called Kamikaze Heart. It was a terrible song. <laughs> and I don't know why we were kind of into it. It had Richard doing a boom, 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 like a heartbeat. And we were doing these, here comes my kamikaze heart. It was just awful. But we were trying to make apple pie. <laughs> and we come up with this idea in the middle of it, maybe what it needs is this real cool ooh part. So we like started doing this, ah, uh, ooh, ah, uh, ooh, ah, uh, ooh, and just, we thought it was sounding pretty cool. <laughs> he said, Ron, what do you think? He says, boys, I don't want to piss anybody off, but I'll tell you, it sounds like dogs howling to me. <laughs> A lot of magic with Ron. A lot of magic. I'm Thank thrilled you. to even bring him up. Thank, Thank you, you for bringing up his name. Tell, Joe, tell him a story you told the other day about, uh, I guess it never hurts to hurt sometime. How... Well, yeah. Never Hurts to Hurt's a big hit for the Oak Ridge Boys. I don't know if you've heard it or not, but it's a really cool little song. And, and um, Ron started playing me the song for months before the recording sessions in Muscle Shoals. Went down to Muscle Shoals to do this one. And, and uh, it was a little bitty song song but a great well-written song and I didn't know if I could sing it and he kept telling me you can do it you can do it this is for you man this is your song this will be a hit for you and I just come off singing the last song I sang lead on was a song called love song which one I want to sing a little love song I want to sing I mean you know it's just boom boom and I, and this song is like you try and hold on 
And I go, I don't know, Ron, I ain't feeling it, man. Well, we get down to Muscle Shoals. Ron makes me do it. We've got the greatest musicians in the world playing the track. And I kept going in there. I used my Elvira voice. That didn't work. And I used my love song voice, and that didn't work. And used my old gospel quartet voice from many years ago. And I just couldn't make the song happen. So Ron says, well, let's just take a break and think on it. I guarantee you this song is for you. Well, we go in the bathroom, him and I, to go to the bathroom. Just hanging out. Yeah. <laughs> well, the bathroom in Muscle Shoals had these really cool acoustics. You remember the Bee Gees were big during that time. So I started going, you try and hold on to the moment, but time won't. I was fooling around. Ron says, that's it. That's it. Let's go. That's it. Went into the studio in one take. I sang that song in that little bitty voice right there. The thing became a number one smash country hit. So Ron Sancy's right. Joe Bonzel wrong. <laughs> I'm yes, number sir. eight. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, my grandmother, Elvira Hart Collins, you guys are our family so much, uh, Roy, uh, along with Julian Gray. Oh. And I want to, uh, uh, want to put you on the spot. You're on the stage now. Can you please just ask what you'd like to say? Is, is your grandma gone now? Well, let me ask you a question. When she was here and Elvira was a big hit, did she think that was cool or did she hate us? Uh, she had a, a custom license plate on the back of her car. Ah, whoa. <laughs> All right. <laughs> oh. <clears throat> chorus of that? Yeah, what's the key? We'll do a chorus anyway. <laughs> you try and hold on. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sillier today than I planned. <laughs> okay. okay. Mm. One, two, three. Elvira. 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 My heart's on fire for Elvira. Here we go now. Giddy up. Boom, pop, boom, pop, pa, mow, mow. Giddy up. Boom, pop, boom, pop, pa, mow, mow. High or silver. Yeah, way. There you go. <laughs> it was the biggest record of 1981. Crossover record, uh, sold millions of copies, was played by every radio station in the world, and, and kids were singing it with us everywhere, singing Oom Papa Mau Mau with Richard. Now, my question is, that was 81. How many of you were born after that? <laughs> That's what I was afraid of right there. <laughs> That's frightening. That's frightening. Well, you know, to be here at the uh, Heritage Foundation, uh, like Joe said earlier, it's a great honor for the Oak Ridge Boys, and we uh, know some of the things that you stand for. And in our business, we have a lot of opportunities, and uh, as singers and musicians traveling around the world and going to places uh, that you growing up as a kid, you really didn't have the... Uh, idea that you would ever have the opportunity to go to some of these places and uh, early in our career when we four had not been together too long uh, we were singing and starting to sing country music and uh, had met Ron Chancy and uh, our manager was Jim Halsey he's uh, managed Roy Clark and a, a stable of the top country music acts around uh, you know, as the Oak Ridge boys, like Dwayne mentioned, we don't really get into politics and stuff, but but we have opportunities to uh, see what politics does in society. And uh, in 1976, the Oak Ridge boys uh, were offered a, an opportunity to go on a cultural exchange program to what was uh, the Soviet Union. It was a supreme socialist, and uh, when it was still strict communist, and to 
to go there for three weeks, we uh, flew into Moscow and uh, traveled overnight by a rickety train to uh, Riga in Latvia for a week, then from Riga back to Leningrad for a week, and from Leningrad back to Moscow for a week. And uh, on that trip, as young country music singers and entertainers, and every night we would be singing it was on a Country Music USA tour, is what it was called, with the Oak Ridge Boys and Roy Clark and uh, another opening act. And uh, so we would sing to these huge auditoriums packed with people that really didn't understand the words that we were singing as a language, as an English language, but yet our songs and our music was able to transcend it was able to reach beyond language barriers. And uh, going on that trip, there was things that we saw and had to experience going into a socialist communist situation where our songs were all, uh, they were, they were all, uh, we had to turn in the words, and then everything was scrutinized to whether we were able to sing them over there or not. There was no freedoms for that. And But to go within that uh, for three weeks into a country, into that setting, it was uh, really an educational experience for all of us. As uh, And, you know, you as young guys, we were not that politically involved as much. You know, we grew up in the homes that we all grew up in, but uh, it was a thing that traveling in most countries we had been to, it was not such a drastic change in uh, what we were seeing and what we were submerged in there for three weeks. But to see what socialism and communism was firsthand and to live under the uh, extreme strict rules of no one owns anything, the government owns everything, and they basically own everybody. It's, uh, and you see citizens and uh, that actually, uh, you don't own your own refrigerator, you don't own your own home, you don't own your uh, stove, everything, your car, you've got to file papers and, if your, refriger if your refrigerator goes out, you've got to apply for a new one, but it might be three years before you would get one. So uh, there was a lot of things that we saw in that environment that made us come back to America with a much more uh, appreciation for the freedoms that America had at that time and uh, to see how the evolution of things have happened in our country. Uh, sometimes it, as citizens, it can kind of throw you back when you see some of the policies that's being presented in today's uh, platforms. And, uh, and you realize that a lot of young people and a lot of people in this country don't really understand that are buying into the big lie of, uh, you know, take from everybody and uh, everybody's going to do better. But that's not what we saw there. It was like stepping back in time 50 or 60 years. And society is what, what we saw when we were there. It was like unbelievable at how far back in time that that society was... Uh, it, was surviving in and living in, and it was a, uh, it was a very sobering, and educational experience for us, and we came back to this country, much more patriotic, much more thankful, to have been born and raised in America, with the freedoms that we had had at that point, and uh, so in today's world, it's. Sometimes it's, uh, it's kind of concerning to see how the evolution of uh, uh, the political structure and the platforms that are being presented 
in mass form to America to strip all of us of our freedoms and our uh, opportunities and our choices of freedom uh, in this country. And uh, I didn't come here to really talk about that, but sitting here, I just uh, kind of wanted to share the fact that although we aren't, we don't get politically active, we as singers sometimes are subject to situations that we have opportunities to participate in where you can't help but see what the political structure is within the countries that we might be traveling to and guest in is, uh, is our career has evolved. And so uh, I would like to personally commend y'all for your uh, participation here with the Heritage Foundation. And, I might add, when we got back from that Soviet Union trip where they showed us through what they call museums, they were really churches, but they wouldn't call them a church. But when we got home, we flew in to the airport right here in Washington, D.C., and we all got off the plane and kissed the ground. Like William said, we were young guys, and it was very influential to us as very young guys back then. I mean, we hadn't even achieved real success yet, but we got to see what it was like to see people kept down. And I, and I know what William's saying here, and I know you've heard it well, and he said it well, is that um, sometimes in this day and age right now, it seems more like people are being kept down. Everybody's being kept, you know, under the hand of this big government thing that seems to be going on. And the thing I love about conservative thinking is the fact that we, we, we really can run this country and give people the freedoms to be what they want to be without having the government intruding on every single thing we're doing. And now they're intruding on everything. And um, we don't like it. And we ain't running for nothing. <laughs> We've seen the result of that. So, yeah, the end result is, is not a pretty sight, actually. and. Um, Thank you all for doing something about it because I know that's what you're really about here at the Heritage Foundation. We know all about you, and we have studied you as well. And in fact, <laughs> in fact, last time we were in town here, I, I ain't supposed to tell this, but we emptied the trash off our bus at the Brookings. Uh, <laughs> it was my idea. I take full responsibility. Boys will be boys. True story. <laughs> it was like four in the morning, and we had done something here, I think, for President Bush at the time. Was that when we did CPAC? I don't know if it was CPAC. That was just last year we were at CPAC. Yeah, we were at CPAC last year. Yeah, we sang at CPAC last year, which was kind of cool. And uh, no, it was uh, W. 40, 43 was president. We did some big event here, and uh, he brought Barbecue. us in. Barbecue. Was it the barbecue? We did the barbecue. Because okay. we've done tons of these barbecues. Three. We work, for, <laughs> we work for every president of the United States since Jimmy Carter, except one. I don't think he's calling. <laughs> uh, Joe, do you need to keep on any kind of schedule to allow time for them to take photos with you all and everything else afterwards? We want to do one last question. And that then would depend on our up. tour director and PR guy that's out here as to what is next on our They've agenda hidden in if over we have here. time. <laughs> oh, man. Okay, this is a good one. <laughs> so uh, we're riding on the bus with Bob Dole. Okay, it's the four of us, Bob Dole. I think Boehner was on the bus, I think, in Ohio. It was in Ohio. And... Um, uh, Secret Service guys, obviously, and everything. And, and there was a press the contingent. Guy. Yeah, Ted Koppel was on the bus. And uh, first of all, a funny story about Ted Koppel. He's in the back of the bus, and he's asleep. So we all went back here and crept back. And we went, <laughs> well, I'm when, I'm, no, I went when I'm feeling mighty fine, I got heaven on my mind. Oh, don't you know 
I want to go where the milk and honey flow. He freaked out. He woke up, the dang wig went sideways, man. But anyway, what else happened on that bus? There? And the reason, the reason that Koppel was there was to do an interview with, with Bob Dole. So Bob Dole goes to the back of the bus to do his interview for Nightline. And we're sitting up in the front, and uh, I'm sitting up here in the jump seat, and there's a microphone there that goes outside. And a lot of times Bob Dole would speak as we go into a campaign event. He would speak to the people. Well, he was back there, so I got down in the seat and went, this is Bob Dole. Welcome. Thank you for coming. We're going right into the event. Nice dress, ma'am. Nice dress. <laughs> Dole. So I'm being Bob Dole up there, and the Secret Service guys are on the floor. Everybody's laughing, and he's back here doing the interview, right? <laughs> so we do another campaign stop or two, and that night we're at a hotel. We all check into the hotel, the whole campaign, press corps, everybody. You know what them big things are like, and we all are at the hotel for the night, and I'm just wiped out tired. I think we sang... Yeah it, was a, yeah, it was just a ridiculous uh, campaign tour. Remember when Bob Dole took that 96 hour or whatever it was? We were, on, we were on most of it. Anyway, I'm wiped out, tired, and I lay in bed, and I flip on the TV, and there's Nightline. And there's Koppel talking to Dole. And in the background, you could hear, Bob Dole, welcome. <laughs> He's the funniest thing that ever happened ever to me. I'm, I'm in there all by myself thinking, oh, my God, listen. Okay. And that's my Bob Dole story. <laughs> I like Bob Dole. What, another, what a great servant he was, too. War hero. I read two books on Bob Dole. What a life Bob Dole had, and I appreciate Bob Dole. He didn't win. We need to start winning, y'all. Go ahead. Thank you, gentlemen. I believe, Adam, if you will look on the disc, the cut we need is number 11 to get Joe's song that he referenced earlier uh, while they're doing their photo ops. But otherwise, we're dismissed, and we'll have the photo ops and music background. Yay. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you.